We'd like to welcome author and historian John Wilkman. He will talk about his new book, Screening Reality, How Documentary Filmmakers Reimagine America, about the history of American film, nonfiction filmmaking and discuss some local history. You might remember when he came to the library to speak about one of his many books, Flood Path. Um, in addition to an active career as a nonfiction producer, director, writer, John has lectured on film history and production of documentaries, taught nonfiction writing at USC, classes of, um, about the history of Los Angeles um, for UCLA. Um, he has interest and involvement in local history. He has many other accolades and projects. So I'll let him talk about that. Um, remember, you're welcome to put your questions in your chat throughout the lecture. Um, during the Q&A for afterwards. Welcome, John. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, everyone. Let me just give you a little start here. I've made documentaries, I hate to say it, for more than 50 years. Uh, so it's really been my life's work. It's something I care deeply about, and I'm very interested in it. Over the years, I've accumulated certain experiences and knowledge, and I wanted to share it. But a more immediate incentive came from concern about what some have called a modern post-truth era. Uh, where reality can sometimes seem up for grabs. I mean, I was convinced that uh, an exploration of the evolution of nonfiction filmmaking could offer some important insights, cautions, and maybe suggestions for the uncertain future we face right now. I take a long view in this book and a wide angle approach, uh, revealing some surprising parallels between past and present. As an example, on the left, you see Thomas Edison's peep show kinetoscope connected to a phonograph with 19th century earbuds. To the right, with a surprising parallel, a 21st century virtual reality project viewed through an Oculus Rift headset. The woman on the right is looking at the headset. What she's seeing is on the left. The first photographs that move were a search for truth. They were created in 1878 by an eccentric California photographer, Edward Mybridge to prove that for a time, all four hoofs of a running horse were off the ground, Mybridge took a series of sequential photographs. When viewed in rapid succession, they produced an illusion of movement. It was a preview of movies to come. A further search for photographic truth inspired Thomas Edison when he created the first practical motion picture system. In the 1890s, Edison's associate W.K.L. Dixon shot movies in a shed called the Black Mariah. It was the first movie studio. You see it on the left. Also, ever the entrepreneur to assure future profits, Edison produced the first copywritten film. You see it on the right. It was another documentary record, a short experiment that captured a lab worker's sneeze. Establishing the form of film presentation we're familiar with today, in 1895, the French brothers Auguste and Louis Lumiere created a movie system that projected images on a theater screen. Their first movies were proto-documentaries, scenes of everyday life and images of distant lands, the Lumieres called document tears. The earliest nonfiction films were also known as actualities. Searching for a way to immerse audiences in the world of film, enterprising cameramen like Billy Bitzer, who would make movie history with D.W. Griffith, clung to the front of moving trains and shot footage that took moviegoers on exhilarating trips they called phantom rides. By 1915, movies were no longer considered a fad. They, they told compelling fictional narratives, but photographer Edward Curtis on the left took still photographs of Native Americans who were considered at the time a vanishing race. That led him to make a film called In the Land of the Headhunters. And the image on the right shows some of the striking images that are in his film. What was happening at the time is interesting because the Canadian government, like many people in the United States as well, had banned the traditional Indian cultures. And so the Kwakutl were thrilled to be able to go back and make costumes, do ceremonies they had been banned from doing. So for them, it was an exciting time uh, and a way of really collaborating with, with uh, Curtis in the making of the films. During World War I, American newsreels informed 
but there were government sponsored film reports meant to boost public morale. They stirred accusations of propaganda that shattered debates about the credibility of nonfiction films intended to persuade. There was a flood of immigrants who were coming into the United States at, the, at, at that time. And the concern was very similar to today, what impact would these alien quote unquote peoples have? What would they do to our country? How would they change our country? So one of the first and earliest filmmakers was Henry Ford. Uh, and he began doing educational films. And one of the goals was to show, have teachers use these films in classrooms as part of an Americanization process to bring immigrants into the model that Henry Ford and others thought they should be, this idea of a melting pot. When you come to America, whatever you characteristics or culture you had in the old country would dissolve away and you become this American melting pot. Also what Ford wanted to do in these early documentaries uh, was to, give the sense of what he called Fordism, what was America. And his feeling of, of business, which was very popular at the time, was that the economy of America was based on consumerism and based on workers making money so they could consume and the consumption would support the economy. So from the beginning, films are going more than just sort of showing you things. They're now beginning to express a kind of a, a philosophy of, of, of what America should be. In 1922, there was an unexpected box office hit which surprised moviegoers and their audiences. Nanook of the North, considered the first narrative documentary, starred a notably unglamorous Inuit family of seal hunters in the Canadian Arctic. It was directed by Robert Flaherty. He's seen here on the left with his collaborative wife, Frances. Limited by the bulky silent camera equipment of the time, Flaherty wanted to show what Inuit life was like before the influence of the white man. It's a story of another time, but its impact was that these were people who had been looked upon as, you know, local color. They, they weren't seen as individuals. And in Anna Nook of the North, you get to know these people as people. And surprisingly, very different people in America suddenly could see a, a link between these people who lived a very different life and find connections. And again, documentary film or nonfiction film was making that kind of connection. Husband and wife Osa and Martin Johnson brought their African adventures to movie audiences in the 1920s and 30s. It was a time of special turmoil. Osa, born and raised in a small Kansas town, was an inspiration to a new generation of women who inspired for a freer life. At the same time, there were these indirect influences of these films. You see in the background these natives. Well, many of them had been trained also to assist Martin and, and Osa in making these films, but he wanted to present them as part of the exotica of Africa. The 1920s was the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the images of, of African natives uh, reinforced the feeling that these were savages uh, possibly deserved to be suppressed as they were in the United States. They weren't really prepared to join modern American society. In the 1930s, a generation of activist documentaries stayed closer to home. In the dark days of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt's administration applied government solutions to national problems. 31-year-old film critic Pere Lorenz was chosen as FDR's shooter to make documentaries. Lorenz's films, The Plow That Broke the Plains and The River, are lyrical exposés of environmental conditions in the Great Plains, advocating for New Deal solutions that conservative Republicans considered socialistic, if not worse. Locally focused free market advocates pushed back, something that continues today with the debates about how to respond to today's COVID-19 epidemic. Truly socialistic, if not communist critiques of the injustice of 1930s America came from radical photographers and filmmakers like Leo Hurwitz and Paul Strand. Their docudrama, Native Land, attacked racism and strong arm union busting. But with theaters controlled by Hollywood studios, it was hard to get their film shown beyond small venues with audiences that were already convinced. Reaching and influencing far more people than left-leaning documentarians during the 1930s and 40s, the March of Time news and documentary series was produced with corporate support from Time Inc. Raising questions about the proper portrayal of reality on film, the March of Time stories adopted a dramatized attitude toward truth featuring actors and reenactments. The series was far from overtly politically radical, 
but had important influences on public attitudes during the dime of the 1930s isolationism in the face of emerging war in Europe. For most of movie history, documentary truth tellers were relegated to the periphery of film business. You certainly didn't make money making documentaries and not a lot of people watched them anyways. They were in theaters, they were short subjects, they were uh, educational films in classrooms or that kind of stuff. Well, that all changed obviously when the war came in 1941. And also the doubts about government involvement in nonfiction films, which had been all through the Roosevelt era, suddenly disappeared. Many of Hollywood's greatest directors signed up to apply their filmmaking skills to making documentaries. On the upper left, you see holding the film, that's Frank Capra. In the middle, uh, with his hands on his hips, is John Ford. And he was a uh, active military guy. He had set up a, a naval reserve unit and he got into the to the scene right away and, and started his own film unit. On the lower left uh, is George Stevens. And he found himself uh, toward the end of the war carrying his own camera. He had been a cameraman for Laurel and Hardy. So he knew about how to handle a camera. And he found himself documenting the end of the war and of uh, the impact of the Holocaust in the concentration camps. On the upper right is William Wyler one of the few of the Hollywood directors who actually had familial connections to what was going on in Germany. And he made a film, a very famous film called Memphis Bell about a, the last bombing run, the 25th bombing run. But all these filmmakers really were, were, were changed uh, and, and by their experiences. Uh, during the war, uh, you know, we were all saying we're fighting for democracy and freedom for all, blah, blah, blah. Well, one of the problems was is that the United States military was segregated. So again, nonfiction filmmakers wanted to use nonfiction films as a way of dealing with this. So the film, The Negro Soldier, is, uh, again, under the direction of Frank Capra, is a classic because it basically tells the history of the involvement and the participation of African-Americans in every war in the United States from the even before the Revolutionary War, and it was an eye opener for most Americans, white and black, I think. Uh, but it was to say, it began to set up the feeling that, wait a second, you know, we've got some work to do here. that's not gonna be solved by defeating Japan and Germany. So another thing was that was not dealt with and didn't really deal with it very much until the Vietnam War. It's PTSD, the aftermath of war. It was known as shell shock. It was, had other kinds of things. And John Huston, who was one of the Hollywood filmmakers who got involved in the, in the war making documentaries, he made a remarkable film called Let There Be Light. And it was really the story of psychological damage that war had done and the attempt, and with some success, of rehabilitating soldiers who had come back uh, from the horrors of what they saw in combat. Um, well, when the military saw the film, uh, they were not all that pleased. And uh, Let There Be Light was banned for 20 years. The idea of the invincible hero in combat cut against what the military wanted. They didn't want to deal with the idea that, that combat is tough. If the 40s and 50s airtime of television was filled with easy to take entertainment as it was, the power broadcast documentaries was revealed in the video journalism of two men, Edward R. Murrow and Fred Friendly. Uh, on the right, you see uh, Murrow with his endless cigarette. And on the left, looking as he always did, a little unkempt, Fred W. Friendly. And the two of them did a program called See It Now, and eventually a series called CBS Reports. And probably their most notable thing was taking on the man on the left, Senator Joseph McCarthy, um, who had had this toxic influence in American politics as an anti-communist. And he held up sheets of paper and, and just lied blatantly. These papers have the list of, you know, all these communist people and there. He claimed the army was filled with communists and that the press uh, was lying and concealing uh, this traitorous activity that was taking place in our government, really endangering American democracy in a demagogic way. Well, Morrow and Friendly took him on and used his own words to eventually expose for what he was. And he eventually was censured by the by by the uh, the Senate, this had enormous power, and this excited some people and and terrified others. As people were trying to figure out what are we going to be as a country, we started exploring that in the 1960s. And at the same time, there was this technological development that happened. 
the limitations on documentary filmmaker going back to the earliest days and certainly on, on Flaherty and, 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 and Pere Lorenz, these cameras were big, they were heavy. Uh, it was almost impossible to shoot sound even when you had it in the field. You could certainly could not run around and chase somebody. And it's hard for us to, to imagine what that was like until the development of a style of filmmaking that had used lighter cameras, more light sensitive film stock and the ability to, to easily record synchronous sound. It was called Cinema Verite. It had been started in France and it just, it was an explosion of nonfiction creativity. And the pioneer of this was on the left, Robert Drew. And he was convinced that documentaries could be the equivalent of real life dramas with real people living their lives and captured uh, on film because the equipment was gonna allow them to do that. D.A. Pennybaker, the guy with the top hat and the camera, uh, he's doing a film about Bob Dylan called Don't Look Back. Below him uh, on the right, the three people, uh, on the left is Charlotte Swearin, a very interesting woman among many important women in the, in the history of nonfiction film. Uh, was an editor with two much more well-known people standing as Al Maisels and his brother David. The Maisel brothers, again, were part of this new movement of saying we can create dramas that are drawn from real life with real people in real situations. And so they began to open up a different kind of, of documentary reality. To me, the master of this form is the man on the, the left, uh, is Fred Wiseman. And Weissman has been making a film every year. Uh, he's now 89 years old, and he continues to make these remarkable films. And he, he has no narration, no music, no interviews. He just puts you in the situation. In 1973, uh, a family in Santa Barbara, California, the Louds, agreed to be uh, the, the centerpiece of a PBS series called The American Family. They had no idea what they were getting into, neither did PBS and neither did America. It had an enormous influence on America in those days. It really changed again, a new direction for nonfiction film. On the right, a husband and wife camera team, uh, Alan Raymond with his camera and his wife, Susan, with her sound equipment uh, are covering. They basically, the 12 part series started as a sociological examination of modern American family and it soon took on the trappings of, of a real life soap opera. Woodstock, uh, it's a concert film, but also it records what's going on around the concert at the time. And it was directed by Michael Wadley, who, as you can see, uh, prefers to work shirtless whenever he can. Uh, it mixed entertainment with a close up look at this new thing they call the counterculture in action. Making movies was never cheap though. And even a low budget documentary, it required equipment that could be expensive. And the cost of film uh, uh, processing and editing added to the challenge faced by independent documentarians. Again, in the 1970s, that began to change with the advent of relatively inexpensive Sony videotape camera system called Portapack. And this again was, was incredible because first of all, you could see the images you recorded right away and play them back. And if you didn't like them, you could erase them. So that started a new revolution in the 70s called Guerrilla TV. And a book came out, as you see on the left, the cover is Guerrilla Television. You didn't have to be in a studio or work for a broadcast network. You could get your porta pack, your video camera, and you could make the movies yourself and get out and do it and not have to go through the, the system. And so new groups called Video Freaks and True Value Television, TV, TV, became popular and they succeeded in getting some airtime on television. And there was humor and there was entertainment and people made fun of things. So they, they went to the Republican and Democratic conventions and they, were, they shot not what was on when we all saw the speeches. They said, what was going on in the background? But this idea of a reverent and personalized documentaries would continue into the future. And part of this high personalization is again, that uh, who, is, who is making the movies and who is telling the stories? That began to change thanks to public television. So as PBS began to rise, the networks quickly got out of the documentary business and left that over to public television. And they began to produce films, not just about aspects of American culture, but by individuals who represented that, that culture. So Henry Hampton Jr. in the upper left, uh, he produced one of the landmark PBS series called Eyes on the Prize about the 1950s and 60s African-American civil rights movement. 
On the upper right, Chicano filmmakers made a series called Chicano, which told the story of the Chicano political movement. Arthur Dong, on the left, brought Asian American stories to a wider US narrative. To his right, you see a, a scene from the documentary, The Times of Harvey Milk, brought, by, uh, uh, brought LGTQ stories uh, and a new respect and relevance to that. And on the right, even Native Americans, they found access and influence. So the idea of this melting pot that Henry Ford had sort of touted in, in the days uh, began to change. And people said, well, we're not a melting pot, we're a kind of a salad bowl in which these individual cultures and in ethnic influences, you know, they all contribute to a very diverse and colorful multicultural America. And that idea was appealing to a lot of people and frightening to a lot of people as well. Another group, half the population of the United States that it was often left out of, of, of filmmaking in general and documentaries, uh, you know, women have been pioneers in the first decades of, of, the, of Hollywood history. But by the 1930s, when movies turned into big business, they were shunted aside. In the decades that followed, documentaries provided a creative alternative for women filmmakers, like two-town Oscar winner Barbara Koppel. Her first film, Harlan County, USA, captured the power of organized action, but also the beginning and the decline in power of influence of organized labor that started during the Reagan era of the, 18th, of the 1980s and continues today. Now to make a bit of a jump, part of the appeal of nonfiction filmmaking comes from the ability to expand and deepen vision, to take us places, introduce us to people we'd never really known, and to be immersed in other experiences and other points of view. And many of the first Edison Peep Show films were viewed like carnival attractions. Uh, they, uh, there were glimpses of the unusual. And that is a thing that persists to today. Now with big screen projection, movie experiences could be spectacles on a larger scale. In the 1950s, in an attempt to encounter to counter the appeal of television, Hollywood movie makers developed large screen Cinerama in 3D, as you see on the left. Uh, one of the most famous scenes from Cinerama was a ride on a roller coaster. Well, we all know where that came from. It came from the Phantom Rides of the 1900s. An IMAX camera, you can see on the right, uh, is, a, is no little handheld device, but IMAX films have been enormously successful. And Greg McGilvery, who's behind the camera, uh, is one of the prime makers of, of, of IMAX films. And uh, he is, his company is the first billion dollar box office documentary production company. IMAX films are hugely popular. They bring nature and science in a way that's easily digestible. And also almost every IMAX film you go to ends up with a phantom ride, a helicopter soaring over something. So it's an, it's an interesting mix of of education and uh, uh, experiences and thrill experiences. Uh, Ken Burns, uh, seen up on the right, is arguably the best known American documentarian. In the face of the influence of cinema verite during his, his beginning period, his, his historical documentary films are proudly traditional. They're lengthy looks of the American experience based on in-depth research, formal interviews and thoughtful narration. More than ever, Burns' work like his landmark series, The Civil War, is a reminder that history can be an evolving process of reevaluation. And documentaries play an essential role in informing a sometimes contentious process. Here he is seen uh, during work on his series, Baseball, with his longtime producing collaborator, Lynn Novick, and NBC anchorman narrator, John Chancellor. Probably the most disconcerting aspect of present American life is a relativist attitude of what's real and what isn't. Again, documentaries have played a, a, an important role in determining what is true and what isn't true. And the films of Errol Morris, the man you see on the upper right, looking into the viewfinder, uh, he began with a film in 1988 called The Thin Blue Line, which is a story about a murder of a police officer and a man accused of that murder. And what Morris did in Thin Blue Line is, is he took the evidence that had been presented and show the alternative points of view of what the evidence showed, sometimes conflicting, sometimes leading to different kinds of conclusions. And in fact, in the process of looking at this evidence and then showing it on screen in reenactments, he, it led to the, to the uh, reversal of the conviction of the man that had been unfairly convicted of the crime. Unlike Errol Morris, Michael Moore uh, on the left with our former president, George W. Bush, uh, is politically provocative and very forthright. No subtleties in, in, in Michael Moore's documentaries. Uh, 
He also brought something relatively new to documentaries, uh, humor. And that, uh, I think, made his first, his, his first film, Roger and Me, hugely successful. And this film, Fahrenheit 9-11, about how we got into the war in Iran, uh, Iraq, rather, uh, it, it was a, a kind of a mixture of, of dry, dark humor and uh, muckraking journalism. Uh, that did not please uh, supporters of, of President Bush and others who saw him as twisting the truth of, of, of not uh, being fair. Uh, rarely did people from a right-wing perspective get involved in documentaries, except if, uh, in a financial background. Uh, and that changed with the passing of what's known as Citizens United Supreme Court decision, uh, which declared that the expenditure of money for political purposes was an expression of freedom of speech. So you could spend as much money as you wanted uh, on your expression of your, of your own views. So that led to a huge rush of uh, right-wing sided document documentaries, and such as the one on the screen here called Death of a Nation, which lauds Donald Trump as a new Abraham Lincoln, fighting for individual rights to make America great again in the face of an onslaught of lies and violence from the left and an untrustworthy press. The film was a major moneymaker in 2018. So these films are not, you know, in some ways these films were not only carrying a particular point of view, but they also expressed an attitude that surprised a lot of people. Uh, and uh, it certainly reflected a change politically in this country that the world of documentaries didn't necessarily have to always come, certainly in advocacy documentaries didn't always have to come from from the left, but they still persist. And they persist with one of the most prolific muckraking documentarians of today, Alex Gibney. Uh, Gibney's film like the Oscar winning Enron, the smartest guy in the room are often based on in-depth print journalism. And again, that's the effect that documentaries can have. A lot of people you know, are not necessarily book readers. They wouldn't necessarily read the book that his film is based on, but they would, would watch his documentary and they did. So his films are a way of, of taking this in-depth often research and getting it to a larger audience. Again, with or without politics, expanding choice is a critical thing that's happened in the, in the last you know, 30 or 40 years. In the, you know, in the 1990s, the television monopoly for thoughtful documentaries nurtured by PBS programs like Frontline, founded by David Fanning and produced by Randy Aarons at Rath on the lower left, you can see them, was challenged by the Discovery Channel founder, John Hendricks, seen on the upper left, with uh, anchorman, CBS anchorman Walter Cronkite, who joined early on with some programs. But perhaps the greatest contribution to this new golden age, as it was called, came from edgy, emotional, and uninhibited films supervised by a woman, HBO's director of documentaries, Sheila Nevins. Sheila enjoyed pushing the boundaries of propriety and encouraging an emotional appeal, often favoring that over information or, or analysis or even open advocacies. Her films were enormously uh, popular and it really began what is, is now called the, the, uh, the golden age of documentaries. As theaters dominated distribution were eclipsed by broadcast television then the choices of cable, today on-demand streaming options of services like Netflix and Hulu used relatively inexpensive production costs of documentaries to expand their growth, influence, and profits. Uh, Binge-inducing series like Making a Murderer spans decades with the entertainment appeal of crime mysteries and courtroom fiction. More and more as documentaries adopt the trappings of fiction and attract more viewers than ever, arguably they sacrifice old-fashioned constructive influence on a 21st century American in need of useful, factual, dependable information. Underlying much of the evolution of screen reality, as I started to say, is this increased personalization. For most of the history of the movies, audiences were relegated to the receiving end of a communications pipeline. As early as the 1920s, this began to change as Americans produced their own home movies, inadvertently creating what modern historians have come to see as revealing glimpses into the past. Starting in the 1980s, trained documentarians like Ross McAuley on the, on the right made their lives the subject of personal essay films like Sherman's March, talking about his relationship with his Southern upbringing and particularly with Southern women. Today, everyone has a cell phone that can record video and distribute it around the world with YouTube and Instagram. In the process, audiences can learn at best to become more sophisticated and critical consumers of screen reality, or worse, make truth even more undervalued and personal to the point that it begins to lose any kind of a broader meaning. 
The devaluation of truth happened while many Americans are just looking for a good time on television. For decades, a mutant form of documentary filmmaking based on the lives of real people have been arguably the most influential form of screen reality. It can be traced to the cinema verite adventures of the louds on American Family. Producer Mark Burnett on the right is the king of reality TV. Even if viewers know that what they're watching isn't always on the up and up, many don't care, preferring to be entertained uh, by truths that are just fun. Uh, when more thoughtful critics dismiss the significance of shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, The Apprentice, one of the most successful reality TV shows produced by Mark Burnett, crossed the line from credible appearing artifice to the real world when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States and America seemed to enter a post-truth reality. So what about the future? Is truth as Time Magazine declared dead? I assume everyone here hopes not. However, even if respect for verifiable reality makes a comeback, there are challenges looming. As they look ahead in the last chapter of screening reality, the development of virtual reality promises to conjure environments that are as immersive and interactive as the real thing. The man in this picture is answering questions from students about the Holocaust. The students are real. The man is a virtual reality image of a true Holocaust survivor. His responses are assembled from a by a computer drawing upon a lengthy interview he had done long before. This example adds to our knowledge. However, other uses of VR could mislead us. Documentarians will be again at the forefront of this, this challenge to our understanding of the world as they've been you know, since the 1890s. And in the process, the importance of determining the truth will become more essential and more challenging than ever. If you cannot trust what you're told, uh, that's a serious blow to the survival of democracy. And I hope we can now work out a system of asking and answering questions. Hi, John. Thank you very much for that. Hi. We do, we do have some questions. Good. Um, I, I have one. First of all, um, when you were talking about technology change, you also just after that talked about um, public television and how and I thought that that both of those things together, I mean, people can um, film, like everyday people can film and share their stories. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, well, this somewhat connected. I mean, what public television really was created for was essentially to be a public service, uh, since it didn't have to necessarily uh, you know, bring in advertiser dollars. Uh, and it also could have an educational component to it, an informative component to it. So at its best, uh, public television has, has served that purpose, uh, purpose very well. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, who should tell the stories? Um, should it be the people, should filmmakers, uh, African-American filmmakers, should they, they should be able to tell their story. Women should be able to tell their stories. Uh, and in the past, that wasn't always possible. And even to this day, basically, the world of film and documentaries is, is still very much dominated by folks like me. Uh, but when the technology became less uh, expensive, it was easier for everyone to get and make a film. And PBS became a place where those films could be, uh, could be shown and broadcast. That didn't mean that PBS didn't have problems, and they do have problems because they're in very delicate political sensitivity. They, they are often afraid of offending anybody. So they have to be very, very careful uh, in many ways. So the most, uh, the most challenging documentaries uh, are on a series called POV or a series called Independent Lens. They're made by independent filmmakers, not by PBS, but they usually appear at 11 o'clock or midnight. Um, and uh, so that's the outlet for it. But the difference really is now is with streaming, uh, the problem was you can make a film, but who's gonna see it? Well, now with streaming, you can make a film, put it on YouTube, and the next day a million people have seen it. So that's had a huge difference. The question is, what are they seeing? I mean, how thoughtful, how you know, uh, uh, valuable in what these films are showing uh, are. So that's the question always been along is, is that, yeah, you can, you can show it and we can see it, but should we, you know, what are we going to get from seeing it? So it's very exciting for filmmakers because they can now get their work out there. But they have an extra challenge of making sure, listen, if you're going to take an hour of my finite number of years and time and minutes of my life to watch your film, 
I hope the film is going to be worth me watching. So we need to do that. But the, 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 there's been a real stress going on in documentaries recently because they've been so successful. Many documentary filmmakers are looking to make their films more entertaining, more interesting. And as they do that, they go farther and farther of pushing, you know, with the bounds of, with, traditionally, the bounds of, of attitudes about how do, you, how do you find the truth? How do you show the truth? And the goal is to make the film fun. So a film like, you know, Tiger King, which is a huge success. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a real guy. And yeah, there's a real place. But I mean, the film is not necessarily a documentary record and people don't watch it necessarily because they're, ang they're angry at the treatment of wild cats. They're angry because he's a bunch of weirdos and they're crazy people. And we just wanna see all these crazy people doing crazy things. So the idea of saying, gee, you should be concerned about the, these private zoos and how they treat large cats becomes secondary and tertiary for the audience. The primary thing is, God, look at all these weird guys and gals doing crazy things. And maybe, you know, maybe her husband actually was thrown to the alligators. And, and so we need to keep our feet on the ground as documentary filmmakers, but also as audiences as well. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one comes from James. What percentage of documentaries involve quote unquote, lying to tell the truth, or at least exaggerate the facts to make a point. Your point that is challenging to determine the truth is worrisome. Well, that's the whole point. I mean, there are some people who want to say, ah, it's all lies, <laughs> it's all lies, it's all lies. And the argument can be, well, gee, uh, you made this documentary about somebody uh, and uh, you say it's the truth about them. Well, what happened before you turn the camera on? And what happened after you turn the camera off? And what happened outside the frame? So whatever you say about this guy, it's just a big bunch, it's all hooey. And that's the ultimate relativism we're facing today is that uh, people are saying, oh, you can't trust anybody. So that leaves room for one person to stand up. Oh yes, trust me, just listen to me. I'll tell you, and you don't have to think, you don't have to be evaluate. So yeah, I mean, all filmmaking, all art form, all life, my talking to you, I'm not telling you everything I need to know. Uh, the question is, is that you're aware of what you're doing. And that's the challenge for documentary filmmakers is that you can't tell all, show all, but you must make your best effort and be honest with the audience. If you can, if for example, I do a film about somebody uh, who, you know, uh, uh, you know, beats his wife, and I never mention that, and I I portray this person as this wonderful, kind, and gentle person, and I've withheld that information from you. I knew the information, and I withheld it. That's wrong. If I didn't know it, that's different. I should have found out before I made a portrait of somebody, I should have gone as far as I could to find out who this person is before I do anything. So it's a constant struggle. No, there's no final absolute. I mean, you, that's another, this is a huge anti-science thing that's going on now. Oh, you can't be scientists. They don't know anything. You know, they claim and they change their opinion next week. And they say, oh, Mars is like this. And then a year later, they say Mars is like that. They don't know anything. So I'll just believe that Mars is made out of cheese because it seems like cool to me. So documentary filmmakers have a big responsibility. And I talk about this in the book. And yeah, they can't, they need to be aware of as much as possible of what they're showing and saying is to their best ability is reflecting what they've seen and understood. And honesty, because the key thing, and I say this in the book, unlike fiction filmmakers, you could have a film that's a, a fiction film and it bombs and you go on to have another career. But documentary filmmakers have a special relationship with uh, audiences. If you make a documentary, the, the audience starts with the opinion that they can trust you. You're gonna talk about true things as best you can. If they find out that you haven't been truthful with them, you not only made a bad film, you've lost everything. You've, you know, if a documentary filmmaker loses trust, you lose everything. And so people say, oh, Michael Moore, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he exaggerates and leaves things out and all. Yeah, and it's true. He's a satirist. He's not a journalist. 
then you have to say, okay, well, then how far do you push the truth uh, as a satirist? Uh, Shakespeare wrote fictional plays, but his description of human beings also was true. He understood human characters very well. So the idea is, is that, okay, did you consciously lead, did you consciously mislead me as a documentary filmmaker? And if you do, you're going to lose my trust. And that's happened with Michael Moore's most recent film about the environment, uh, which has been getting heavily hit, not only by uh, those who uh, you know don't don't care about global warming, but by documentary filmmakers and say, why did you mislead people here? You're giving us all a bad name. And if I want to make a film about global warming, they're all going to say, well, it's all a lie because Michael Moore, he lied in his film. So I'm not going to trust you. I'm going to trust the guy who thinks global warming is a bunch of crap. Um, so we're really in, in difficult times and documentary filmmakers have, a, and, and journalists in general, have this great responsibility to do the damnedest they can to find the truth, convey it effectively. And when they find out they were wrong, say they were wrong. And then you can start developing trust. That's a long answer to a short question. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, we have another question that's um, along those lines, I think. Um, how will the accuracy of what is portrayed in documentary films be assessed? And should it be, and if so, by whom? It should be assessed by the people who watch the film. And it should be assessed by the filmmaker to start with before they do it. And that's what I started saying, is, is that, that with young filmmakers, often I, I say that if you, have, I'll give you a story from my early days. I did a documentary about, uh, uh, in the Bronx, about a guy in the Bronx who got his neighbors together, in a very rundown area of the Bronx, got his neighbors together to do a garden where there was just debris, and he did this great garden. And I went out, I was a young filmmaker in those days, and I went out to interview him. And in the midst of the interview, he just started crying. And I said to myself, great. That's going to be the ending of the film. Tears, that's gold, that's gold. When it was over, he said to me, I'm sorry I cried. And I said, no, 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 it's fine. I understand you. He said, well, no, really. I mean, uh, my dog died uh, yesterday and I still haven't gotten over it. And I went back and my editor, wise old editor who was there had said, uh, and I said, this is going to be, look at, he's crying, it's terrific. And, and, and then I told him the whole story. And he said, well, was he crying about the dog or is he crying about the park? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not going to use it because I don't know. If it's about the dog, I'm lying. And I know it could have been about the dog. And I'm lying if I put that in there. So I didn't use it. Today, there are a lot of filmmakers that say, oh, you know, it could have been the dog. I don't care. It's, it's a good ending. Let's put it in there. So that's where that. Now, it's the same thing when you deal today with our president. I mean, you know, 20,000 lies a minute or whatever it is. Constant fact checking over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. You know, that's it's a kind of becomes kind of exhaustive, but that's the goal. If you're basically, you know, you want to, you just want to people get tired. Okay. Okay. Whatever you say, it's fine. You know? And I think that's filmmakers you know, are, are tempted by that as well. It's such a cool sequence. Don't tell me that it's not correct. Um, and again, it's up to audiences now to be demanding and say, uh, you know, how do you know that? And to come back and then critics and other people do investigations, they write articles, and then you can't investigate, but you can read the article about, you know, Lion King, not Lion King, Tiger King. You can read that article and people have investigated and found that a lot of things just aren't true about that film. Now you can say, I don't care. I just like the film. I don't care that it's, you know, it's not true. Well, now you're participating in the, in the, in the deception. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, how does a documentary maker put his film on YouTube, get people to watch it? How does that, how does that happen for people? Well, there's two different questions. Getting people to watch it is the hard part. <laughs> right. Uh, you, you get a YouTube channel, uh, which, uh, you know, or I use a, a system called uh, Vimeo, uh, and you pay for the service, and they, you upload your film to them, and then it's up to you to get people to know it's the film is there. And if you make films that are successful, people are gonna to come to your channel. Oh, I saw this great film that was you know, just on. Oh, really? And they tell their friends and other friends and word of mouth and suddenly 
you know, you have a lot of viewers. And then you, if you're really successful, you get a lot of viewers by word of mouth, then advertisers come on, you know, and they want to advertise, you know, on your YouTube channel. Uh, so you can make some money. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 the thing is the challenge to all filmmakers. You want to make a film people want to watch. And you, for whatever reason, you a film that it's worth watching. Um, and then the hard work is to get people to watch it. Um, we have another question about, um, oh, uh, any movie, um, let's see, to any movie to make a new documentary about the St. Francis da uh, disaster? <laughs> well, that's another, works, or? another classic example of, of how uh, the documentary career. I'll, I'll, I'll skip back and a little bit. I wanted to make a film about Chicano rock and roll. I found a book, I thought it was terrific. I didn't know anything about it, but I was interested in, 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 in the history of Los Angeles. And I thought this was a terrific story. So on my own, while I'm doing other things, I start to make this film. And I, you know, I, I, I pay a great cameraman to work with me and, 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 and I do some of the editing myself and all that kind of stuff. And I told the authors of this book that uh, this could take 10 years. And they sort of chuckled. And I said, you have to understand that most of the PBS money is in New York. They have no idea who Chicanos are. This is back when I was starting doing it. This is, you know, in the, in the long time ago. And if they do, they think it's just a regional story. It's a story of the Southwest and who's gonna care about that subject? Well, that's part of the reason they have to raise the money. So you go there and say, it's gonna be Chicanos. And the answer back is, well, that's a great local story. I'm sure you'll get somebody on local TV to show it. It'll be exciting, but nobody in Chicago is gonna watch the story of Chicano rock and roll. So we're not gonna give you the money. Uh, well, until I pointed out to them that the, I said, well, where's the second largest population of, of Mexican-Americans in America and after Los Angeles? And they said, oh, uh, Houston, uh, Dallas, and uh, yeah. I said, no, Chicago. Chicago was the second largest Mexican-American population. And suddenly New York said, oh, wow. You know, and they launched the Latino history project and all kinds of things sort of went on because they discovered, and, and, and as did Ken Burns, discovered that this is a story that hadn't been told but you're always against that. So the same thing with the St. Francis Dam. Again, on my own, no one's ever heard of the St. Francis Dam. And I go back, I go back to, to New York and the PBS. I wonder if this thing's the worst disaster ever. All these people died and it's St. Francis Dam disaster. And they say, well, if it's so great and so devastating, how come I never heard of it? I say, well, it's been all covered up. Yeah, sure, it's been covered up, you know, but it's, it, you know, it's a, a Los Angeles story, right? Well, Los Angeles stories, they're all about the movies. And you want to do something about the movies? Yeah, we'll maybe give you some money for that. Uh, but this dam that no one's ever heard of, you know, we're not going to give you money for it. Well, slowly I got some money to the point I, I really wanted to do it right. And I wanted to do all the, the graphics, the computer graphics. I didn't want to just show still pictures. I wanted to show the dam collapsing and I wanted it to, to, to be totally realistic. And that's enormously expensive. So that became a big block. I couldn't get anybody to fund the special effects. Now it's relatively inexpensive. So after working on this for 25 years, maybe now I can get enough money to do the special effects that I want to do. Uh, but so in the interim, I did a book and, uh, and the book was picked up for a, for a made for TV movie. Uh, and eventually the movie wasn't made, but there, suddenly there was some interest in all of it. But they didn't make it for the same reason in the sense that they looked at the costs of having a dam collapse and flooding 54 miles. They figured, hmm, this might be pretty expensive to do, even if it were done in a dramatic way. So that's part of being a documentary filmmaker is, 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 is part of it is not just making the film, it's struggling to get the money for it and then struggling to get it seen. Um, I have a, a question also about, um, you talked about some of the directors and they, earlier and they seemed, um, some of the directors were film, you know, movie makers um, and they did some documentaries. Were there actors that, were film actors that did some of these documentaries? Well, Ronald Reagan was a documentary filmmaker. He narrated a lot of World War II films and acted in them. Uh, actually, this famous story is that he would tell war stories and people would have to remind him he was describing a film he was in, not an experience. <laughs> he wasn't in combat. He'd been in a film about combat during World War II. Uh, 
and so yeah um but going back with this reality question which is always it's always sort of thrown up by saying ah uh, it's all a bunch of lies you know who cares well if we don't care we lose our democracy frankly that's what happens and we have to struggle to find a way to do it and so yeah as films develop for example the, the equipment you couldn't you know you couldn't run around chase people around with a camera like you do in cinema verite so you had to stage things people had to stay in one place so they had to go over here and over there so you could move the camera and do this and that so yeah from the earliest times uh whatever this ideal of reality was was and still is virtually impossible in the sense of this pure world and just like when you live your life you go and, and you and you have an experience and you say my god i went to this restaurant and i had this fabulous meal and this to me sums up the importance of this restaurant and then someone says, oh, but you didn't have the fish? And I say, no, I just had the steak. The fish is the really, you have lied to me. The steak is not the best thing about this restaurant. It's the fish and you lied to me. I'll never trust you about restaurants again. And you didn't want to lie. It's just that there's more information. And so now I'll go back and I say, oh, it's the steak and the fish that are terrific at this restaurant. But I might find out that, you know, vegetarians even better. But I think the, the tendency is really scary to me of people throwing up their hands. I mean, in particular, we're living in this astonishing cloud of lies. It's just astonishing. And people are getting tired of it. They've tuned out. Uh, and worse, they might not care. And we need to be, none of those things need to be, uh, are good for us. And documentary filmmakers can help, help out if they're not dismissed like, you know, the failing New York Times, fake news, New York Times. We ask, oh, the New York Times, it's failing. They're all fake news. I'll read the New York Times. OK, I won't. No. Um, do we have any other? I think we I think, don't think we have any other questions. Well, I have plenty of answers, but I think I've already talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll end, um, we'll end here. But we want, I want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for us. Yeah, thank you all for coming. I, I, I'm sorry I can't see you, but I, I think maybe you'll be able to assemble a list of, of people who came to, to listen to my lies. And uh, <laughs> at least I'll know, I'll, at least I'll know who you were. That's good.